a lot of people will say to us, there's, there's no way we could do what you do. There's no way we could walk into that place. I, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to function. I would just break down. And, and I say to all of them, it's different. When you come onto a scene like that and you see animals actively suffering, sometimes dying, and you, you now have the privilege and the power to pull them and get them to safety, like yeah. adrenaline kicks in and yeah. you, you're like, so. I will process all of this later. I will cry later. I will cuss later. But right now we're going to get the animals out of here. Hi, and welcome to How We Change the World podcast. My guests today are Tim Woodward and Michael Cunningham of Animal Rescue Corps. These two men left lucrative careers in the high-tech industry 12 years ago to find work that was more meaningful and fulfilling to them, something that made a difference in the world. They have never looked back. I think what you'll really find in today's episode is the joy and the happiness that just seems to exude from them, even though the work they do is often painful and grueling. Compassion and commitment are just bound up in every word they utter, and but they're also just so fun to hang out with. So I hope you'll enjoy what is a lively episode uh, where you'll learn probably something about a subject you may not know much about as they tell us stories about their large-scale animal rescue, and keep us entertained throughout. Hello, Michael and Tim. Welcome to How We Change the World podcast. I'm thrilled to have you both here, both of you especially. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us, Deborah. I'm actually I'm really grateful. I love what you do with Animal Rescue Corps and I know that everybody watches and listens will love you as well. So I want to jump into it in just a second. Um I just want to acknowledge that we we have met but only I think once. I've seen you online a lot, so I feel like I've seen you and know you, but I think I saw you once in a restaurant like in, and I think it was I looked back, I think it might have been like 2011. So it's you know and you look exactly the same, which is amazing. Uh, I was just that, thinking about that today. I was like, wow, I think I've known you for like 10 years now. Yeah. That's- that was 2011. So you had just started about 2010. So why don't we start there with where, um, whichever one of you wants to take it, like where, you know, how this started up, like the the, the origin story, if you will, uh, Animal Rescue Corps. Sure. We'll a, a group of people, I was working at a different organization at the time, uh, Animal Protection Organization in Marin, California, um, mm-hmm. and a small group of us got together. Um, uh, Scotland Hazley had a vision for an organization that would support law enforcement and fill that gap in communities that are under-resourced um, when it's time to address a large-scale situation of cruelty. Mm-hmm. And so um, a number of really smart, dedicated, hardworking people got together and um, uh, nobody even had salary. I think for the first year, we just really put everything into the organization. Um, Our first, uh, we launched on January 11th, 2011 publicly. We'd been working on it for a few months at that point. And then our first rescue operation was just um, maybe about a month and a half after that. Wow. And um, it, I, I, we went into our first rescue operation with not much more than a few thousand dollars and um, uh, just worked really hard. And fortunately, people believed in what we were doing and um, have supported us and volunteered for us ever since. We so did have a um, like a, a financial backer in the beginning who was going to uh, help launch us. But then when we realized what it was going to cost us, uh, they wanted to be president and chairman of the board and all this other stuff. And we were like, well, we can do this the hard way and keep it, or we can do it the easy way oh. and, and let go of it. And so we decided to do it the hard way um, and keep it. And that mean that meant Tim and I cashing in our 401s, um, you know. Oh, we, so you started we financing it yourself? We started financing it ourselves and then getting some major donors to help with those first, that first rescue. 
Yeah, you know, it's amazing that. that you had to make such a, a kind of almost a gut wrenching decision from the beginning about your morals and and how you were going to take the future of the operation. Like, when were you going to be influenced by other people? When were you going to follow your heart? Right? Because that's probably one of the reasons why you started is so you could do things the way you 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 saw them or you envisioned them. We had had a lot of experience in jobs that weren't meaningful. <laughs> well, you know, so, I want, so there's there's success in one way, and then there's right. You know, there's this isn't getting me. Uh, there's there's something else. There's meaningfulness. There's doing good work, um, and that you can't put really you know a dollar amount on. Um, but it wasn't there in some of our in our previous jobs. So was, we were fortunate was, that we um, we had had good lucrative jobs in the Bay Area before and mm -hmm. um, we're actually at a place in between and I had started doing some work for a, that, another nonprofit and then, um, it, but it was, it was truly a leap of faith because I, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but the mm -hmm. vast majority of nonprofits never make it past their first or second year. I know. And you're at 12 years now? Yeah, and we just that's, celebrated that's, our twelfth anniversary. Wow! Well, congratulations. I don't care what kind of nonprofit you are; that would be an amazing thing. But I think with animal rescue, is probably I don't know if it's harder to fund than other organizations. Would you say that it is? Oh, I actually, um, I certainly uh, people give to children and women, and and I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of people look first. But um, I will say, because I'm a vegan and we work with a lot of people who are vegans and mm -hmm. vegan organizations, um, and they are always quick to point out to me that it's much easier to raise money for animal rescue than it is for um, mm -hmm. vegan causes, because that, you know, oh, it's, right. It's, right. Yeah. people will yeah. kind of get put off by that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I count my blessings and then promote veganism when we can. Well, fortunately, I think most most people certainly as you're organization would explain that not everyone cares about animals, but the people who do care about them, you know, will reach down and, and pull into their wallet once in a while. But yeah, not, not always at the top of the, of the heap. Um, so you were, you have been together for that whole time, but were you, you know, you're now a married couple, right? Which, what year was that that you got married? Um, Michael and I have been together for 31 years? 30, 30 years. Um, oh, 30 years. Man. 30 so you years. met in preschool. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married for 14 years. Oh, um, that's amazing. Yeah. So so you were already together when you started this organization. You've been working together, you said, in other organizations. Has that yeah, made it? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. So I, I was just saying, yeah, we had um, we had worked together. We were we were in a group of uh, a number of people that worked down in the uh, peninsula, Silicon Valley, that mm -hmm. did a number of financial service startups. And so generally, I you know we would work together in different roles, not working side by side, but taking yeah, different yeah. roles in the organization. And so we were pretty used to doing that. Um, at the time we started ARC, Michael was actually working for another company leading their customer service department. And that's what enabled me to, you know, start working for ARC with no salary. Was Michael basically supported us for that first year um, while we just built the organization. Yeah. Wow. Well, it seems like that has really helped your organization, having the two of you together yeah. all in from the get-go. And I think it was, what, Michael, three or four years before you came in as a paid employee. He, oh, he volunteered it? It? Yeah. whenever possible up until that point. Yeah. I would fly in on the red eye the night before the rescue, basically go from the airport. Superman. Changing clothes <laughs> in the car, and we would go <laughs> really right Superman. on scene. <laughs> we would go right on scene, do the media, do all that, and then I would be out of there by Sunday Wow. Night. Well, something. yeah, you had a, you had a few work. busy years there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe Tim, since you're the executive director, and and Michael, you're director of operations. Is that your title? I know you both do everything. I have a few. But, I have a few. Yeah. Uh, dir like a, uh, director of administration. Oh, administration. Shelter, I said that. Yeah, and a shelter director and public information officer. Okay. Well, we're, we'll get to your part a little bit more uh, in a minute. And I just, Tim, maybe if we could start. Do you want to just maybe describe the the overall, what you do, like what is the mission? What's the, 
purpose? Why do you do it? Things like that. Sure. So um, I, I started to touch on it earlier, but I, to go into more detail, a lot of people don't realize that in communities all across the country, there either is no support for animal needs at all, or there might be just one animal control officer who has mm-hmm. no facility to actually take animals to. Um, there, okay. there may be nothing. So mm-hmm. in those communities, if there's a breeding situation, a hoarding situation, an abandonment, just straight up neglect, anything mm-hmm. involving more than a couple of animals completely overwhelms their system. They're just not set up to handle it. And the other side of that is if it's a criminal case and it's really important to document everything, collect mm-hmm. the evidence and make sure you have an airtight case, m- most deputies and almost all animal control officers have never had the training that would yeah, really yeah. set them up to be successful at collecting the evidence, making the case. And yeah, so yeah. that's exactly what we were designed to do. We were designed to come in with the veterinarians, the forensic experts, the documentation team, and the handlers. And so we go onto a criminal scene or a man made disaster scene or mm-hmm. a natural disaster scene, and we safely remove the animals. And the entire time we're documenting everything, it, you know, from from the from the way they were found before we've touched anything to what their water bowl looks like wow. to what how long their so nails are. Anything. Are yeah. they matted? Are what are they standing on? Are they standing straight on wire? You know, all of that. And mm. if it's indoor, we do ammonia readings and um, other other tests inside to show how dangerous and and unhealthy that environment is. And what part of the, I know you were just in Tennessee for a long time, but could this happen anywhere? I know you went to Mexico, oh, so yeah. you obviously, is there any state in the country? Our and very first they- rescue operation was in Tennessee. And so it organically just kind of started growing mm-hmm. in Tennessee. Tennessee also has an amazing volunteer base oh. of people who really work hard for animals. Um, and the other thing is that Tennessee is very centrally located. So you can address multiple states in the south that border mm-hmm. Tennessee, and then it, you shelter them and rehabilitate them in a central location. And then we move them on up into the, the north, northeast, midwest where there's a greater demand for adoption and they'll get in homes much faster. So there's several reasons why Tennessee, but we have done rescue operations from California um, to Mm. Montreal. Uh, We took in dogs from St. Martin, Mexico, um, Michael. Halifax, Nova Scotia. Oh, really? Uh, Canada, Um, too. Cayman Islands. Um, Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. St. Martin was say, Saint Martin was a big one too. We I flew in a 737 and filled it up with animals. <laughs> Did you really? Oh, okay. that one or, I want to hear more about. Yeah. How probably you gonna, 80 or 90 percent of our cases and work centers in the southeast. Is that but is the need greater there too? I mean, not to pick on the south, but I, I mean is that just more the culture that you've got puppy mill more puppy mills there or whatever? There's, um, in the rural South, there's a bit of a cultural thing where they're not always running to get their animals spayed and neutered. Um, there's a bit of a cultural thing where, oh, it's okay that he's running loose. He comes back, yeah, you know, and things like that. So whereas in the a lot of the northern, northeast and Midwest states, there's been a focus on spay and neuter for decades now. And at one, at some point, they started seeing the return benefit of that. So mm-hmm. they they keep promoting it. They keep investing in it. So the number of homeless animals have gone down in those regions, and so they're they're able to take animals from regions where there's still a lot of work to be done. I think in wanna... some of those northern states too is. And part of that culture thing you were talking about, Tim, is in the wintertime, it is so cold, those animals come indoors. And they they come into the home and there's more of them living with you. Whereas in some of the other places where it's warm enough all winter, they're staked out on a chain out in the yard and there's this disconnect um, from the animal Yeah, that you don't well, necessarily have in when they're in the house. 
Uh, and, and to Although answer it seems the like other aspect, a lot of the pictures I've seen, it looks like there's a lot of disconnect, but we can talk about that. Right? Um, right. Yeah. Oh, we and, got but, the stories. It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're still smiling, which is a, a testament to your strength on both both of you. But mm. go ahead, Tim. I, I do want to make the point that a lot of people think there's more cruelty in the South than anywhere else. But in terms of just cruelty or breeding operations, mm -hmm. that exists everywhere. Mm -hmm. So you, it could be three yeah, houses yeah. down the street from you and it's, it's neglect and cruelty is not exclusive to the South sure, by sure. any oh, means. Oh, absolutely. Right. But, absolutely. and then also there's just a lack of resources in these areas. More, more in the South. Yeah. You know, um, whereas other places their their animal control can handle larger cases or, um, you know, kind of boom and bust type things, but, you know, every once in a while. But there's some parishes in Louisiana that we've worked in. Um, I mean, their, their county shelter gets between 30 and 70 dogs a day, every day, like a fire hose, you know. Um, it's just there's no way to manage it all. There's, and there's no access to low-cost spay and neuter. Yeah. Oh, there isn't. Yeah. And so they do There's not. There's no resources so for anything. Well, there's know? shelters like in a, are you talking about in the cities as well or just more in the rural? In these so rural, rural parishes, rural you know, it, it'll be yeah. one shelter for 900 square miles. Whoa. Or, okay. or if they have access to it, it's a once a year, once a year kind of a clinic thing where somebody comes to that area okay. and provides that resource oh. rather than a resource that is available to the people in that community all the time. Are there people working uh, more at that end of the thing, uh, you know, trying to yeah, raise absolutely. money and organ organizations? There are organizations who focus exclusively on that. Um, there's a lot of foundations good. that give money directly towards that. Um, we assist sometimes, and um, we did a big spay and neuter operation up in Canada, and sometimes we assist with partners um, for example, one of our partners, the Bissell Pet Foundation, has yeah, been doing yeah, a lot of spay and neuter work, uh, particularly in this last year. So, yeah, um, shout out hats to them because they, they, yeah, they really have donated a lot, a lot to animal yeah, they're causes wonderful. of all kinds. They're amazing. All right. So, uh, well, how did you both learn to do it? I mean, you started in 2011. And, you know, you didn't. You weren't trained in measuring. Pneumonia, ammonia, ammonia, ammonia levels, and were you or even rescuing no, them? No, uh, so Arc's first the rescue, job, job? Yeah, Arc's yeah, first rescue yeah. operation was my first rescue, um, but I was not leading the field team. I was there doing communications yeah. and fu and raising money. Um, Michael has always been great on scene doing whatever's necessary, but particularly managing media requests and um, kind of traffic flow. Um, so anyway, yeah, ARC's first rescue operation was my first rescue operation. Amazing, amazing. Um, but I will say we have worked with some of the best people who have trained across multiple other organizations that do this sort of work. And, and now after 12 years, many of us have taken, you know, certifications and training courses, um, oh, that, um, have, have better prepared us. Yeah. So now you're, but do you both go on the operations, which we're going to get into what they are in a minute, but like, do you both always go or typically? It's a good day when we can have Michael on scene. Sometimes, depending on what's happening at the shelter, he's needed more there, but it, it's it's always our preference to have him in the field with us. Okay. So we need to, I think, establish like how the whole thing works. Is I know you don't have your own, so, so one, whichever of you is better or wants to describe this. You know, you get a call, you go on a scene, you rescue animals, and then you you, you take care of them and get them to homes. But right. I mean, I'm I'm cutting to the chase, obviously, really cutting to the chase. But how how does it work logistically? You know, where do you where do you take them? The whole bit, because I when you said Michael's not on the scene, I, I was surprised because uh, I thought it was you two specifically. I actually I thought Michael more than you going in there and pulling the animals out every time. That's I don't know who's I don't know who's doing well, all the work. We're, so we're um, uh, we try to. Um, it's yeah. a it's a great day when we can be in the field together, and we try and do that as much as possible. I see. Um, but sometimes we need someone at the shelter for the receiving of the animals because of the great distance between where the animals are and where we're taking them. 
So I would be on the receiving end. I see. Uh, building, because we build our shelter. Well, that's what I'm trying to get time, to is like, right? where are these shelters so, located? Right. You build them? We do, we do monkeys, we do, you know, rats and mice oh and my chickens. God. And oh, you wow. never know what it's going to be until, until you get there. I mean, you kind of have an idea. Um, you are ready for the be. arc when it's but time, you've, right? You've got to be, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, hit the, hit okay. The so, so th- we're, I just, we need to back up still and say, okay, you get a phone call. There's a, just give me an example. Or if you want to give me a real example, that's fine too. And just like just a few of the major steps that, that you need to take to rescue some. So for group. example, if, if, if we get a call, law enforcement has stumbled onto something and they said, there's a lot of animals here and it's not good and we need help. Yeah. So Sometimes we that's do, through a 911 call that someone okay. made or, or a domestic dispute or yeah. a neighbor complaint, but they end up there and they're like, uh-oh. Okay. Okay. So, right, so you get a call. They reach us. In another and, state, typically, from where you're you're at at the moment. Often. Always on a holiday. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we do a lot in Tennessee, but <laughs> we also, I mean, it, it could be anywhere. Okay. Um, okay. And then we get some basic information and we evaluate, you know, if this is the, you know, number one, are we at that moment uh, able to help? Is our shelter full? Are we already committed? How okay, quickly right. do they need to move? That right, kind of stuff. Right, but right. if we can help, yeah. then we mobilize a field team as quickly as possible so that's my field commander, Amy Haverstick, will okay. put together a field team. And then I, I, I'm usually on scene and will either function as an extra documentarian taking photos or an extra lead handler removing animals. Um, but Amy will lead the entire dis- extraction, uh, making sure oh, every see, animal is getting pulled and handled humanely and safely, making sure people stay safe. And then our other team member, um, Kim Rizak, is managing the intake process. So Mm -hmm. she is managing the veterinarians, the photographers, the scribes, um, uh, everyone who is in a line. And as animals come out, they go through this chain of evidence process. They get numbered. Their location on site gets recorded. They get photographed six different ways. Um, vets examine them immediately and all of that's documented by a scribe. Um, so anyway, a very intensive evidence collection and intake process. And then animals are loaded up onto a van or transport truck and they're taken back to either our standing rescue center. We have a facility that we have available all the time in middle Tennessee, but we also sometimes create emergency shelter operations in a community center or something like that. If we have to shelter in that location. And then Michael, if he's on scene, he's also an expert handler. And so he's assisting with that. He may be managing media calls, um, helping with logistics And if he's back at the shelter, as he was saying, like, we don't know what we're going to find until we get there. They might say there's a bunch of dogs and you get there and there's five different species and you don't know. So we're calling him back at the shelter saying, "Okay, there's 600 rats. You need to prepare for 600 rats. And do you know how how it did? (laughs) And you're trained to go in and and retrieve 600 rats? On that one, on that one, we were on our way. We, we were on our way to that property and I got a call from the media. Um, I think it was CBS calling and they said, are you on your way to that rescue with the little boy in the cage? And I, and I take my phone and I hold it and I'm like, Tim, uh, is there a little boy uh, in a cage? He goes, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, little boy in a cage and snakes, big snakes. Oh, and I'm like, yeah, we're on our way. Um, yeah, 500 rats and mice. Uh, eight- they weren't wild rats. They weren't. No. They they were. They were, breeding they were domesticated them. breeding. Okay. Rats. Well, in this case, now I have to know what happened. I mean, was were they abandoned? Was there? Yeah. Um, well, let so me let me just we, fill in a little bit too on before right. we get into <laughs> those specifics too. Also, um, wonder about the boy. Uh, when Sorry. when we get when we get to a property, we send in an assessment team. And that is when we're walking through the property, counting the animals, making up our plan of where we're going to start 
and our process of going through the property and counting all the species. And that's sometimes some of the hardest work because the animals are actively suffering at that point and you're not able to Help end them it yet. yet. Yeah. Yet. And you yeah. have to walk past, you know, animals that are, you just want to jump oh. in and get them so fast, you know, but you can't. Um, and then we uh, map the property so we know where all of them are. And that's important for later on at the shelter. If we have unsocialized animals, we can, I see. We can, we can put them next to the ones that they know. So much um, to and this. And use that. And it, you, that just comes from doing it, you know, a bunch of yeah, times. But, yeah. Um, so those are, case, those are, yeah. Go what ahead. was that? This yeah. case that he's referring to actually kind of started the day before we went to assist law enforcement with a horrible situation with, I think it was 48 chihuahuas and a trailer that was just beyond. They were selling puppies out the bathroom window. I, it was disgusting. So we went and we helped with these chihuahuas um, and we heard them mm -hmm. talking about, they had gotten a report of, of chickens being kept in little cages in a front yard. And he said, you know, I, I'm going out there to check on these chickens tomorrow. And I said, oh, well, give me a call. Let me know what you find. And so the next day he calls me because they went to the property to check. There were indeed chickens in tiny little wire pens in the front yard. Mm -hmm. But as they knocked on the door to talk to the people, they saw a young boy being held in a cage inside the house. Um, as Michael said, surrounded by giant snakes in other containers. Um yeah. And as that big as our legs. I mean, they're the snakes. Yeah. How old was this boy? Was he 18 months? Two and a half, three? Oh, 18 months. my God. He was 18 months old. Oh, my God. So they, um, that gave them probable cause to start digging further, and, and it was a mess. Um, and so I get a call from the sheriff, and he said, Yeah, there's, there's mm. chickens, there's rabbits, there's dogs, and there's a couple of, and there's some rats. And we get there and there were 600 rats and mice in the most cruel conditions I've ever seen any animal kept in. And we stayed until about three in the morning until the vets had documented every last rat and mouse. And, mm. um, and we got them all out of there. How long did that take to get them all out? You had to literally. Uh, we, we started hours. early in the day hours, and, yeah. and we were there until about two in the morning. It was probably like a 14 hour extraction, 18 hour extraction somewhere in there. Wow. Because when you're working under a search warrant, you can't leave and come back. Everything has to happen in one trip. So you have to get, and we always take 100% of the animals. So it, mm. you get one shot at this. And the animals are the physical evidence in the criminal prosecution. But unlike other evidence that can just sit on a shelf and, and they just have wait, to be cared for. They have to yeah. be cared for. And it's going Need to change. It. Right, that animal is going to change. That that evidence the condition. by the yeah. time the prosecution yeah. happens, that animal is not going to look like that anymore. So right, they've already been cleaned. The documentation is is paramount on all of this because what that does is establish long term neglect. Long -term I just want to pivot suffering. for one second because you know I actually I heard oh no I'm not going to remember her first name. It's a comedian. Her last her last name is Cummings. Can't remember her first name. Um, she was on the Rich Roll show recently, and she was talking about animal, different types of animal situations. I don't know why I can't think of her first name, but uh, she was talking about how in, how it's not unusual for someone who is cruel to an animal to also be cruel to a human, to also be cruel to nature. You know, if you think about it, like when when once you don't have any empathy, maybe you don't have it for. So that's the first time I'd heard about a, a child. No, it's well in, documented. In, it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's well documented for years. I mean, if, if, I mean it, Jeffrey Dahmer, there's any number of them that you can look at that there were red flags and warning signs about a lack of empathy um, where they, uh, they start testing the water by mutilating or being cruel to animals. And then it, it, it will in some cases become humans that they focus on. Mm -hmm. um, I just, the other day, I, I, they were talking about one of um, one of the recent shooting cases or violent cases. And, and they, and I heard them mention just 
you know, kind of off the cuff that um, his mother said he, there had been instances where he had killed animals. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's well documented. Yeah, okay. that the one th- that little boy, sadly, um, that cage was the safest place for him. I wondered if he was, a, yeah, not not they weren't able to get in the cages, obviously. Right. So, all yeah. all of his but, toys were in that cage. There wasn't a single toy outside mm-hmm. the cage. So, I mean, are, are, I know you you have different, and we can go back to that finishing talking about that particular case if you like. But um, do people have? Uh, Gosh, you know, it ups, it, it gets me at such a level, like you guys are very joyful. And then we start talking about it and I find myself like getting so emotional. I can't even think what I was asking about. So, um, yeah, I, I've, I even lost my trip. I guess I was going to ask, are, are these people typically, would you say sociopaths or, I, I mean, I know you're not a psychologist, but I'm just wondering, because some of the cases, you don't even have to answer that exactly, but I'm just wondering if, you know, some of them are hoarding cases. Some of them are actually businesses like puppy mills or or zoos or, or something like that where they're making profit. So I guess you're dealing with different types of people. Some, I mean, not that they're not all dealing with some of the similar things. Hoarding, hoarding is now recognized as a mental disorder, um, and 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 there's we've definitely seen, you know, the full range of that characterized by, you know, the com- the compulsion to collect, mm-hmm. whether that's animals or whatever. New clothes. Or yeah. everything. Yeah. 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 Um, and we've seen some things in hoarding cases that are just unbelievable. I mean, the, the, sh- the show hoarders, it's no lie. Like, it's bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so certainly there's mental disorder there. Um, we've also seen plenty of people who... Um, and I hate, I hate saying it this way, but they did start out with good intentions and they just didn't have the ability to balance it or say no, or, you know, they would happily let the animals go to a better home, but there isn't, and they're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Whereas a hoarder, even if there is a better home, won't let the animal go. Yeah. Some people, some people will be doing fine with their 20 dogs or 30 dogs, mm-hmm. but then there's some type of health event that happens. Oh, so no one's right? able to care for them. And yeah. all of a sudden it goes downhill fast. Yeah. The the man responsible for the, the case we were talking about with the rats and the kid, mm-hmm. um, I I had to go and sit and meet with him and, and try to get and successfully get a surrender on all the animals. Um, and I, it was hard because I, you try not to develop emotional opinions about it. you just try to be professional. Sure, um, sure. But I was so mad at the way that the, that the rats had been kept and I'd never seen anything just so horrible and cruel. Mm. And, and, and so I was mad. I was mad that night and I had to go meet with him the next day. And I, I went in there very mad and I sat down and, and I had to talk with him. And as it, as we conversed, I, you, you could tell that this, man was sort of fractured like mm-hmm. a life of dysfunction and trauma right, right. Oh, and, yeah, and so lifelong problems and then several years before maybe even as much as 10 he had had a traumatic brain injury and so he started out not in a great place and then yeah, received yeah. an injury which yeah, made yeah. him really not yeah able yeah, to yeah. process yeah, rationally yeah. Um, yeah. and then there was lucky. He, he, um, he, he kept telling me how much he loved the animals, which was just hard to fathom when mm-hmm. you've seen how they were kept, but he, he was very sincere about it. And he started talking about one dog that had just had puppies and he was very worried that the mom got to stay with the puppies. Mm-hmm. And I happened to know which animal he was talking about and know that we reunited the mom with the puppies oh. on the property. Yeah. And oh. so I was able to say to him, no, 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 yeah. right. You know, it was this dog. She looks like this. And we mm-hmm. found all the puppies and, and that was what, that's what gave him the comfort to say, rather than being, no, screw you. I'm not going to sign over the animals. He was like, you know what? You cared about the animals here. I'll sign your surrender. Which so that's, enabled that's us really, to- that's good to hear. Cause there is, there probably is empathy in more cases than 
than maybe one would think just looking at the videos, which are terrible, by the way. I mean, there, there's video, I'm talking about the videos that are on your website, which are important and have to be there. And I would love to encourage people to go watch them because it does give you an understanding, even though they're difficult to watch, uh, of what actually happens. Because, you know, we, it's important seen, to tell their story, though. You know what well, I mean? And also in a way that's educational rather than on an ad with sad music, like from the, um, you know, someone who's raising money. Not that you don't have to raise money to operate, you do. At least when you see them on a website, you can just push pause. You know, but that's a luxury I have. And you guys don't have that luxury. You're in the real world and you're, you know, you can't say, well, I want to go home. We've been here 10 hours. There's five more hours to go. Or right, yeah. You can't so, uh, and on, on that particular case, I mean, we pulled 627 animals off of that property. We had 87 mice born in our care and 98 oh rats God. born in our care. And I delivered 11 litters of puppies and I still had nine pregnant mothers Whoa. ready to pop any day. Um so it, the numbers keep growing even after they're in our care. I never just, ever thought of it that. It just keeps getting bigger Whoa. and bigger. Um, wow. <laughs> I was I was delivering like midwifing uh, like three mamas <laughs> having puppies all at the oh same time. So I, I will say a lot of people uh, a lot of people will say to us, "There's there's no way we could do what you do. There's no way we could walk into that place." I, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to function. I would just break down. And, and I say to all of them, it's different. When you come onto a scene like that and you see animals actively suffering, sometimes dying, and you, you now have the privilege and the power to pull them and get them to safety, yeah, like yeah. adrenaline kicks in and yeah, yeah. Something you, takes over. you're like, I will process all of this later. I will cry later. I will cuss later. But right now we're going to get the animals out of here. Yeah. And we're going to get the evidence to help. You're really with the thinking very clearly. Your, your brains we're, are. We need to create a lasting solution here, mm -hmm. right? And if they're a hoarder, yes, it's a mental illness, but we're still going to try and get a prosecution against them to get a judgment. And the mm -hmm. judgment is, at the very least, you can't have animals anymore because the likelihood is that they're going to start it hoarding won't stop. Again. But yeah. we don't have to start from scratch anymore. We don't have to go back and get uh, actionable evidence with probable cause. It's just a violation of a judge's order. So you can just, you don't have to wait until it becomes a big problem again. So um, you end up in court on a somewhat regular basis? Interesting. As and, and a lot of or... it's a lot of it's our veterinarians. So veterinarians are the only people who actually go to school to recognize animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. um, so if mm -hmm. you've got a state licensed vet that says that is inadequate, that is suffering, that is cruel, um, it's a very compelling case in a courtroom because. We didn't go to school, you know what I mean? The defendants didn't go to school to to say, oh, no, it's not, that. that's fine, you know. I see. And, well, and, and, and we're also very versed in the terminology that we use in court that is adequate, inadequate, normal, abnormal. It's, it's not a matter of opinions. It's a matter of fact. And, then, and even in situations where we're trying to make the case, you know, um, sometimes you'll run into law enforcement who's like, oh, that's not that bad. I've seen worse or, or yeah. you know, we'll tell them yeah. to clean it up. It'll get better. Mm. But if there's but they're a They're probably there, their friends or their neighbors sometimes, often right? Often that's right? the case. If too, you're in a small happens. town and one's yeah. a sheriff and one's a... Yeah. Everybody yeah. knows everybody. But if you right. have a vet or saying... Sometimes. If you have a vet saying this is illegal cruelty and I'm going to write a report documenting it, that provides a lot of incentive business. for them to take another look. What other kinds of cases have you done other than like hoarding or, uh, well, we well, haven't then talked there's, about there, So there's the, there's the people who get overwhelmed, good people who got overwhelmed, had a health event. There's right. hoarders, which is a mental illness associated with loss. And then there's intentional cruelty. Mm. Then there is greed. There is people who know what they're doing is wrong, mm -hmm. but for some reason they're benefiting from it, whether it's their kicks or money 
or Mm -hmm. prestige because their dogs went in the dog fight. Um, And those Mm -hmm. are the evil. Those are the evil motherfuckers. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Those are the, those are the ones that, you know, that has to be hard to hold yourself. That's why the police are there. <laughs> to hold the police you guys are back. there to deal with the people. We just deal with the animals, whatever yeah. they, you know, whatever animals. We I have. see. Yeah. yeah. A couple wow. of the other things we've done, we, we've done dog fighting cases. Um, we've done shelters or rescues gone wrong um, where they're actually the problem. Oh. And, um, wow. and then, of course, so things we, you would never think of. Oh, it, sometimes yeah, yeah. those are some of the worst cases we've seen. Wow. Um, and then um, the other thing that we do, um, we we try to play kind of an auxiliary around the the periphery role during natural disasters. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah. what we'll do is either before, if we know that a major storm is going to hit, um, or immediately after it hits, um, we'll reach out to shelters impacted and say, hey, we can take some of your animals that were already ready for adoption and we'll get them out of your shelter. And then the animals that are lost or impacted or homeless as a result of the storm can stay right in that community. A a full shelter is not going to do that community any good. Um, right. Because now you've got all these displaced animals in your community and all the spots are full. So let's get those homeless animals out of there. Okay. Now that shelter can provide the services to its community. If we went down there and we're pulling cats off a roof or dogs out of a, you know, off the top of a car in a boat and then take them two states away or wherever it is, they're never going to get reunited with their families. But if they can stay in that community at their local shelter, the chances of them getting reunited is greater if, if they even have a home to go back to. I think you were, yeah, I think you were down to Ian, weren't you? Hurricane, was it Hurricane Ian? Uh, yeah. So was that, is that what you did in that case? You Because yeah, we it's, kind it's, knew that one yeah. was coming, right? Yeah, yeah we, um, we uh, some some organizations actually establish MOUs with, with communities where they go out <laughs> and do the hands-on <laughs> rescue. Again, mm-hmm. we we try to do this. We'll we'll show up with food and caging and supplies and equipment and give that, and then leave with any animals that were already needing a home. Mm-hmm. and And for now, we feel like that's the best way we can contribute Sounds, to the yeah, whole situation. It's very logical, actually, <laughs> and something I hadn't thought of. Uh, how did you do this with when you? Well, I saw the one in Mexico, and I'm not sure when you said you had a 747 full of. That uh, was a cargo plane. Um, uh, uh, the island of St. Martin after Hurricane Irma was the seventh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how do you get financing for something that that extensive? That like that flight had to be- from St. Martin was three amazing women who lived part time on the island who were total animal advocates, rescuers, and those three women came together and raised an enormous amount of money to pay for that flight. And then we drove down to Florida and met the flight and pulled the We animals. couldn't afford to fly them all Whoa. the way to to Nashville. We could only afford to fly them to Miami. Because okay. uh, it was 50, so I think it was like $50,000 for that one flight. Um, wow. so wow. we all went down in RVs and then got oh, the animals like, off the airplane and then drove them up to Nashville. So and we reunited, we reunited a lot of people in Florida with their pets because they had to evacuate without their pets. Um, uh, and we were able to bring their pets back over to the United States and they came down to Florida and got their pets. Really? And all the ones that were unclaimed, we took up. I can't even imagine their shock and joy at seeing their animal that they never thought they, and somebody rescued it. That makes me um, cry. (laughs) Are they just like, what? (laughs) How did this even, it's like a miracle, you know? It's a big, big problem, but When we all work together, when we all pull our resources, right? Mm -hmm. Because these are big problems to solve. Um, They can be solved. They can be resolved humanely. It just takes a lot of effort and a lot of resources. Yeah. But it can be done. The Mexico case was interesting because this was actually a sanctuary down in Mexico that was caring for a lot of dogs. And but it was in an area where the um, 
the organized crime was really, really bad. And so Very they jealous. started extorting the sanctuary, the people who ran the sanctuary, <laughs> and said, if you don't give us money, we're going to kill the dogs. Oh. And so and we kill had you. to and kill your families. <laughs> so they, they reached kill out to who? The, 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 the people who worked at the sanctuary? So they reached so out to we're the talk, Now we're going into that evil part you were talking about earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah, just for money, yeah, right? yeah. Um, but they reached out to the Bissell Pet Foundation and the Bissell Pet Foundation contacted mm -hmm. us and they said, look, we'll, because it needed to kind of happen very quickly and very quietly um, yeah, yeah. before they realized that they were getting all the animals out of there. Mm. Um, so Bissell said, look, we'll, we'll get them on a plane and get them to you if, if you can get them and take it from there. And so once again, uh, we worked with our friends there and, and, um, and it's made an sure these dogs story. were not in any danger. Yeah. Flew and into so, Cancun. Um, a, big, oh. uh, a cargo plane came out of Laredo, Texas, flew down to Cancun, and uh, they brought the animals out of the jungle. Filled oh, up this the was airplane. in Cancun? Or in the in middle of spring area? break. In the middle of spring break, too. So just all of those logistics. The, the sanctuary the was further there. inland, but yeah. Cancun yeah. But that was the closest close. airport. They had to drive several hours to get to Cancun to fly out. To fly him out, and then we brought him into Florida, and then Florida book. over to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of resources uh, on the human aspect, so I was, I was looking on your website when we were first talking about. I was thinking of uh, interviewing you guys, and I'm looking at your, I don't know, it's under financials or something. And I, first of all, it's two two parts to this point. One is that I see your actual tax return on there, and I'm like, oh, like I feel like. I shouldn't be seeing this. It's like looking in someone's, you know, underwear drawer or something. I just like, I never have seen that. Yeah, it's just right there. And so, so I read it because it was so interesting. I never see anyone else's tax return. Yeah, most organizations are required, nonprofit organizations like us are required to provide it to you if you request it. But we just skip that puts step it and we there. make it available. Um, we're very proud. Um, we do be. really big things with not a lot of money well, and well, consistently. Or, pe right. or staff. Right. So, which was my <laughs> next point was that on, in looking at the tax return, because I was fascinated by it, because I used to I've run a couple nonprofits. So I'm like, oh, how do they do it? Um, but there were 1,700 volunteers listed on there the year before. I'm like, 1,700? Like, that's mind-boggling. I'm at 6,800 right now in my database. Uh, in Tennessee, I have over 3,700 in Tennessee. So these angels honestly i they just you so if you go to a certain area somebody just gathers them or you gather them you just put out a it, you must have a great it's, network it's it runs just, the gamut so we have people who come once and then say it's not for me and we yeah, have people yeah. who come every spring break because that's when they can and, um, and then we ha we are so fortunate we have people who come every day, eight hours a day, like it's a job. And they take a significant role, like a role with real responsibilities. And they give us that time every week. This is amazing because we're talking about a time when you can't get anyone to work anywhere. I mean, you know, yeah, every, it's a labor of love and we're, we're so you, blessed to have amazing. I feel like I get to scrape the cream off of every community I go through. It's really? just because it's the people who show up, right? It's, it's the helpers. It's the one when we put out a call and say, Hey, we need help that, that come and show up. And, um, they're just the best people. Um, and not everybody's available every time. And volunteering sure. tends to be a very transient part of your life where, you know, um, either you're off for the summer or you don't have any grandkids yet. Uh, grandkids always ruin my volunteers. Some of my best <laughs> volunteers I've lost to grandkids. But those grandkids um, can be your future volunteers. Uh, well, maybe. I hope, you know. <laughs> you guys um, live long enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Part of, part of what we do um, Employees are focused on productivity and efficiency. Part of what we do has nothing to do with that. Sometimes, mm. sometimes it's just going in and sitting with an animal in their cage or next to them and just get them used to people being in their space because they're either so frightened, abused, 
or unsocialized, it's going to mm-hmm. take a while, right? We don't have to get them to where they're sit, stay, roll over, shake my hand or anything like that. But yeah. where we want to get them is to a point where we can put our hands on them, where we can touch them, where someone else can touch them. Um, and then our placement partners will pick up that uh, rehab and mm-hmm. and continue with that um, a lot of times in a foster home. Um, but volunteers bring the heart, okay? Mm-hmm. They're there because they've chosen to be there or in some cases have worked their whole lives so that they can retire. And now they want to do it. You know, now they can do mm-hmm. that thing that they really have worked their whole lives to do. But you've got all ages. Very dedicated, very dedicated yeah. volunteers. Yeah. yeah, all ages. But I will tell you, we, we would be remiss to not say that um, uh, mature women make the rescue world go round. Is that like right? Without without our uh, without our women volunteers, um, and they, I mean, these women work so hard, and um, they are so dedicated, and and we're really happy for the men who come and to and you know to have that as well. But the the women carry the load. That, I never never knew that. I mean, I and and Amy as our field commander is just amazing too. Um, to have yeah, a I wish, woman I wish in they charge were here. on scene calling the shots and. Very cool. Uh, it's just fantastic. Yeah, it really is. You know, this is a, a podcast on how we change the world and not completely about animals. So I want to I want to get to just a little bit about you know why why you chose to do it before we before we get to the end of the podcast and and just some of the more emotional I guess parts behind it and and even logistical reasons why you chose to do it. Um, but one one thing I think people ask about a lot with dogs that I just want to get your take on is puppy mills. I mean, I live in a, a building and there's I, uh, the number of days I see new puppies coming from breeders. And I don't know how to explain to people, you know, people know there's dogs available in shelters, but, but they'll say, well, what's wrong with buying from a breeder? What's wrong with that? You know, other than the fact that there's, there's ones that aren't getting adopted. I mean, is there, I don't think people are, are. Do puppy mill dogs principally go to pet shops? Is that typically what you would get in a pet shop? Is something from a puppy mill? It it, it if it's a large, well established puppy mill, generally they're being wholesaled out to puppy mill chains or I mean, uh, pet store chains or oh. distributors who further bust them up and move them around. Um, But then you go smaller than that and you have um, smaller puppy mills or that aren't registered, that aren't, that aren't regulated, or you have backyard, what we call backyard breeders, which is kind of a next step down. And those people are, they may have a relationship with a, a local small pet store, but generally they're selling at flea markets. They're selling online. They're selling in the newspaper. And so what, why you, when you can know that you should not be buying this animal is when they don't invite you into their home, show you the mother, show you the father, show you how all the dogs live. Mm -hmm. Because if they're just going to meet you in one room or they're going to meet you in a parking lot Uh, and they're going to show you this little puppy mm -hmm. and you don't get to see how the mother lives and how the father lives, then you're almost certainly supporting cruelty. Are there ever times when you think it's okay to buy from a breeder? I mean, not that you would, but is there a justifiable I argument mean, for it? it? Not for me. I, right. I mean, I could, I could never do that. I have good friends who have, and mm-hmm. for them, it's about that, you know, but they know the breeder, they know the breed, they, mm-hmm. you know, for them, it's about this, you know, this thing of the, the particular love of the breed. And I give them trouble all the time. And I say, look, I can, I can, you know, find you but, a yeah, dog yeah. just like that. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's not illegal. And yeah, they're, yeah. you know, and, and if they, if ideally they're not perpetuating cruelty, except the fact that, homeless animals die in shelters every day. Mm. Um, so, sure, there, you know, sure. sure, there are instances where, you know, for that person, that's an acceptable decision for them. It would yeah, never be yeah. for me. Yeah. And those are awesome animals that are dying in those shelters. Those aren't, yeah. there's not something wrong with them. I know. They're not discarded 
used or broken, these are perfectly normal, wonderful companion animals, and yeah. time runs out for them. Well, and and it, I can't even count the number of times that I've spoken with somebody, and they're like, you know, we went through all of these steps, we did all of this research, we found, you know, these particular bloodlines, blah, blah, blah. And the dog is genetically messed up. Yeah. High anxiety, separation yeah. anxiety. It weak feels like bones. more often than not, actually, because of you know, the it's, breeding. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having a little bit of mutt can go a long way in terms of a dog's <laughs> health and, and, and That's mentality. That's a great, great line. Yeah. We, right. um, oh, I know. We did, a, we did an Amish, we did an Amish puppy mill um, this this spring, hmm. um, 514 dogs, I think it was. Uh, it, it was actually it was, last it was November. A, it was a bunch of, it was what? November? Last November. November. Um, hmm. uh, and it was a bunch of organizations that, that got together. But here's some of the collars that are on those dogs. And they, they have these little USDA tags. USDA. Right? So this. What does that mean? It means they're, they're livestock. This puppy mill was regulated That's what I by mean, the USDA. They're livestock. Okay, this is the tag in the in the cow's ear. This is and this is I on know. this is on a Pomsky. Uh, this is on a Doodle. This is on Wait, a what is it? Spaniel. And they're mortgaged. Okay, there was a six hundred thousand dollar mortgage on the dogs, and so in order to do the seizure, they had to get the bank's buy off to let. The assets be seized because it would no longer be able to collect on the mortgage. What the what was the intention? What was the uh, commercial what breeders? Was, oh, huge commercial breeders. breeders. Commercial. Commercial. He, he they get a no, U.S. But are you saying that the the, the USDA U.S. government is commercial? They license these commercial it, breeders. I had no idea. Certain, idea. Yeah, I had breeders no of a certain idea size are supposed thing. to be licensed and regulated. But those were all um, that kinds doesn't mean of they are. Different. And the regulation is the the inspection and regulation is usually inadequate. In this case, um, there had been such egregious and repeated uh, problems that the USDA, to their credit, said we're not going to let it stand. We're gonna we're gonna take this guy out. Um, and um, and wow. they, that they, had to they be bad, Dad. Because if you've ever been to a USDA approved slaughterhouse, <laughs> right. It's not a really high standard that you have to meet to uh, no. to get that little tag somewhere. Well, you guys, um, I I'd just like to talk for a second about, um, you know, Tim. I saw some. I think it was. I I don't think I'm Facebook friends with Michael, so it must have been you that I saw a post the other day that you 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 bought a ticket for the lottery or, or Powerball or something, and you're like, oh darn, I didn't win, or maybe someone gave it to you, and you're like, well. It's good. I wouldn't have changed anything about my life anyway, but it would have been fun to give the money away, which is what I always think would be so fun to do. But it hit me like really hard because in such a positive way, because I'm like, wow, you guys probably aren't, you know, getting rich doing this. <laughs> you, you, have you, do you eat? Do you, do you get, do you get oh, yeah. electricity I mean, paid? We actually I, moved from the Bay Area in California to my hometown in Virginia because we could afford to have a good quality of living here uh, on what we make. We couldn't stay in California. We could have never yeah, bought yeah. property in California. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we moved back here and we got uh, our dream home that I've been in love with since I was a little boy. Oh, that's amazing. And as it turns out, Michael, a California boy, is just as happy here as I am. <laughs> and um, the only problem is our work is in Tennessee. Um, but, Nine hours um, away. <laughs> and I actually had somebody well, challenge okay. me the other night about that post and she, who has won a lottery. She, she's a lottery winner. <laughs> and she's like, you know, that's not true. Um, you'd be out of here so fast. And I, I'm oh. like, I, I gotta tell you, I wouldn't like, <laughs> I, I love my home. I wouldn't yeah, leave it yeah. for anything. Yeah. And for as long as I can work, my job is to, is to, is to, promote Animal Rescue Corps and make it as sustainable as possible. Well, you both know of what the other world is like. You both worked in finance. You worked in the Bay Area. You made good money. You, you know what that, you know the drill. And also, you chose we, we this. Also, yeah. We also lived in the bubble, uh, what I call the bubble, right? So we were in the Bay Area. We were surrounded by a bunch of people that were 
just think uh, you thought just like us. Yeah, the mindset. And you're one. You're one of forty million. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great to be there and get that community and gain your confidence and figure out who you are. But then we've left that because we we need to go where we're needed um, in these communities that just don't have the resources where we can make a big difference. You know, um, I'm sure for many of our volunteers, Tim and I may be the first gay people that they know of on a, on a, on a first name basis or would call Mm, friends. You're in a pretty conservative Um, red state type situation. Exactly. Um, uh, or, or us serving, we serve vegan, uh, lunches and the shelter. Um, Mm. and a lot of times it's the first chance they would have ever had to have vegan meals. Um, maybe even heard of it in some cases. When we were up in Canada, we had the uh, the First Nation tribe made us lunch every day, and it was the first time they had ever made vegetarian food. Everything really? in their whole huh. life. Um, so it's we can make a bigger difference in these areas, but then then I think we could had we stayed um, what I call in the bubble, which is well, a great place you- and I love, and I was born and raised there. But yeah, but, right. You know, we did several companies that, you know, the, um, we were, you know, at some point we were going to get rich off of stock options Mm -hmm. and then we would start living and doing something that mattered to us. And then it just became, let's stop waiting for that. Let's just go do something that matters to us. Yeah. Yeah. So you would both readily advise someone to, to follow suit, not just with animals, not even with animals, but just, if there's something, I mean, your lives have changed. They couldn't have changed more, right? You you went from a city to a, with, with, you're probably eating differently, dressing differently, acting differently, different entertainment, everything about your life that could have, and plus you were in a, a gay friendly city, if you will, compared, I mean, you gave up literally everything to go do this and it doesn't it always out. turn out great, but it worked <laughs> out. It probably doesn't always work out. But you would do it again. I guess that would be the bottom line. Oh, I'd absolutely do it again. I, I, In the beginning, I didn't have the expectation that we were going to create something that would last. Oh, you I did thought it. We it would, I, I thought we would spend a year or two rescuing a lot of animals and then probably spend years paying off all the, the money that, we yeah, had spent. Yeah, that surprises me. Um, but that was going to be okay. You know, I, yeah, I could go back yeah. to my corporate world. I yeah, could always yeah. go back and start making money. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and this was going to be a chance to, to do some good. Um, and as it turned out, thanks to donors and volunteers, mm-hmm. um, it, we've managed to keep it going. It's a leap of faith. And if you just do good Amazing. work, people will support you. Yeah. These, so, uh, um, I, if I can share just a couple quick thoughts, sure, um, sure. Michael touched on something that um, I we should mention, and I thought of something else in terms of our workload and the, and what we do when we're not doing criminal cases, when we're not because that's our expertise and that's mm-hmm. where if if we're okay. needed, okay. that's where we need to be. Mm-hmm. But when we're not occupied doing that, we do what we call shelter relief, and that means we reach out to one of our existing partners or perhaps uh, a shelter that is having a difficult time for some particular reason, and we'll go and pull animals from that shelter that have already been rescued, that are already ready to be adopted, Uh but then we'll put them through our process and we'll transport them as far as necessary to get them into one of our partners where they'll actually get into a home much faster. We just did this in uh, Arkansas. Remember the, the, you know, the shelter was already full and then uh, a person passes away and he's got 30 something dogs in his house. Mm-hmm. Um, and they went and got all the dogs and brought them to their shelter. And when we got there, we opened up the door and the cages were all the way to the door. And we had to scoot sideways down wow. the aisleways um, because they're just up mm. to here, up to here How, with them. Yeah. But and the other thing we should them. mention. So, is so you go and take those to relieve the pressure is what you're saying. We, took, yeah. Them, yeah. we emptied them out. And that was great because it allowed them to go in and do a deep clean, to do a bunch of repairs oh. on their facility. Oh, you emptied them completely. Th- we, wow. we, we emptied them out. And, and, and it and allows them-, them to kind of catch a breath and yeah. do some of those things that you can't do when you're always full. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and then where do you take them? Like, how do people, if they somebody wants to, I mean, I know you have other people adopt out the animals after you clean them and give them medical. So they came they, back they, to our facility, our rescue center. Which is where? They, Virginia? they all got vetted again. Oh. Um, we double checked, made sure everybody's vaccinated, heartworm tested. Um, we do behavior evaluations. Wow. They get bathed, groomed. They get photographed. And then we collect all of that and then we push it out through a, through technology to our dedicated vetted mm. placement partners. And then they'll look through and different ones are good at different things. Some of them like medical cases. Some of them have a, a spot open up for their behavior modification program or some of them, you know, whatever the case is, they'll pick the ones that they can help the best or possibly get in a home the soonest. And then we divide them up and drive them as far as we need to. Um, it creates a conflict of interest for us to handle the adoptions. We're, yeah, I could see we're that. We're seizing the animals under yeah. the authority of law enforcement, so yeah. we can't then get adoption fees and and so we hand I them see. over. But to also, you you kind of have homes. your specialty and your hands are pretty full. It doesn't sound you know, like you our, take a our lot facility of is to get them out of harm's way, get them yeah. stabilized, yeah. get them evaluated medically and behaviorally, and then say, okay. Where is the best place for them to go to continue the recap? Yeah. So our, how, our, the, how? the people we seize animals from like to tell judges and anybody that'll listen that we're making money off their animals. That's why oh, we do it. When oh, the truth so is that yeah. we yeah. spend anywhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars an animal mm -hmm. if there's no serious medical condition to make that, sure right, that animal right. gets what they need and gets into a home. And we never collect adoption fees because we don't place animals directly. So there's no there's no gain financially for by us. And we don't charge for our services. You know, we're totally so how, free. I'm changing the subject a little bit, but how are you? You are you seem like the happiest people that I really come across. And it's and and I'm not just saying, oh, because you're doing work that's meaningful, but like you're seeing hell, you know, and you're like well into it. You're you're not avoiding the depths of the pain. And so, I mean, do you have some way PTSD. that you well <laughs> you probably do have ptsd but i don't know what you have it's, but i mean how do you cope you have to find a way to cope with it it's, sick it, humor um we sick. have a very dark sense of humor sometimes um that helps a lot of us people get have that. Things, you know um i, I mean i i always think God, what would I do if I knew about this situation and I didn't have the power to do anything about it? That oh, that's I could really live. interesting. That yeah. would make me dark. That would, and we've had cases like that where we've gotten onto a property that's and it such is a horrific, great answer. Yeah. And law horrific. enforcement makes us leave. And those cases live with us forever. Uh, those cases are what we think about at night. Because yeah. we've seen how those dogs were kept. And They're so anyway, right when now, you have right the power now. to change it, that's huge. And and at the end of the day, you that's, feel accomplished. You you're yeah. achieving something. It's their every last day. bad day. You know, no more bad days when we get there. Wow. You know, this is it. It all ends. And that's why when we that walk through also... on that assessment, it's very difficult to walk past some of the animals right. when you're just assessing the situation because you can't. You can't but, just start. But you also know it's almost over. That would be the great name of an organization, though, is it's it's their last bad day. <laughs> last bad day. <laughs> but Animal well, Rescue yeah. Corps is an excellent name, too. And uh, it is because it's a, you know, it's yeah. like the Peace Corps. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a volunteer army of, yeah. of compassionate people who want to make a huge difference. Yeah. You guys are amazing. So, so we should so, mention the other thing we did this year was the Invigo Beagles, which was huge across yeah, please do anybody that's that. focused on And it brings up a different point, point, yeah, which is really important about testing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we were honored to work with other groups to to move, what was it, 500? 85, I think we, 85 came through our facility. 800 uh, moved into our partner. So... Just give a little backdrop on that. Who, who, why were you, why were they rescued? Because there's beagles being animal tested all the time. 
All so this was a yeah. giant breeding facility in Virginia that um, I think the, t- the total was something over 4,000 animals in this breeding facility. Once again, they had to be inspected and regulated and they had failed miserably in terms of um, animal care and safety and, you know, horror stories. And um, so they were so anyway, providing after- the dogs to animal to like cosmetics or medical, something like that. That's pesticides, what cosmetics, oh, medical pesticides. testing, oh, okay. you name it. And okay. we could do a okay. whole show on why that's not effective. And, and, and you there's, know, it's there's like, legislation pending on that, I believe. Yeah. And, and even like 95 Major. plus percent of, of products that make it through animal testing still fail. Um, so they're just, so there's just, there's better ways even, to do it now. Yeah, and, yeah. and they still test anyway, this, this cigarettes are addictive. They're still doing that? Yeah. Because there's a grant available. So keep doing it. You get the grant. And these dogs were awesome. They were so docile, so sweet, curious, um, really. And that's why they pick beagles because, you know, they're they're not going to fight you They'll back. They'll let them, yeah. They'll let you. And yeah. so it's kind of yeah. doubly heartbreaking. So you, So what happened? How did you, you went in and just... Oh, so we got, uh, once again, we got contacted, (laughs) one of our partners that we've worked with for a number of years in California that moves a lot of dogs from the Southeast to California and places Mm -hmm. them. Um, And they have a particular love of beagles and hounds. Um, And Mm -hmm. they had actually been working on this case before some of the larger organizations got involved, like HSUS. Uh And so they had already agreed to take almost a quarter of the total. Um, And knowing that we reached out to them because they're in California and we're much closer to Virginia. And we said, look, how can we help? Can we transport? Can we, can we, you know, Mm -hmm. shelter them until you're ready for them in California? Like, just tell us what we could do. So we did a little bit of that. Let's get them out of Invigo, even if they can't take them in California yet, because they were taking so many. Let's get them out of Invigo. Because well, they had to. The, the court ordered that they only had a certain amount of time to get all the animals out. So we're like, look, bring, if you need to bring them here, we'll hold them here until you're ready for them. So you did that. You you end up keeping them at your facility. And our How ears bad that are had still to be ringing for, <laughs> from uh, 85 beagles in the room. <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> well, it was interesting well, on that one because we had um, we had the beagles there, but I also had the operation out of the dark dogs there and the operation mm-hmm. out of the dark dogs um had never seen another dog you know what i mean so, they were and kept people in can darkness. see that video on your website there you had a little yeah. bit of uh, coverage yeah. on and that. the beagles they, had never had... seen another non-beagle um uh none of them had been outside um so there's all oh these new God. things happening you know and you got uh i had uh, uh about 110 dogs in the shelter at the time. None of them had been outside. Well, except they, except to get to your location, I guess. Right, right, right. But they, they, didn't, know, they didn't know what but grass they was. They didn't uh-huh. know what yeah. wind. Yeah. They didn't know yeah. what wind was. You know, you're trying to teach a dog what wind is, and it's this thing that's touching them, and they can oh, feel it, but they can't see it. Right. And then the trees are moving, and it, yeah. it's all these firsts um, that were privileged to my, um, help them. My lights are all burning out, so we might have to wrap it up. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I think it's last call. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know whether you, whether he or you um, want to share it, but I'd be remiss in not acknowledging that your son-in-law, Chris, was one of our earliest and very biggest supporters. And this organization would not exist today without his early support and both being a major donor and also just helping us grow our audience and our list. Um, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. Chris, I knew he was there at the beginning and, and helping get it off the ground, but yeah, I didn't yeah, know we, too much beyond Chris, that. Without Chris, we would not have made it. That's I'm, great. I, I, yeah, well, thanks for mentioning that. Chris Hoare, H-O-A-R. <laughs> um, yeah, they have, a, they have a number of little puppies around their place all the time, too. So, yeah. so no, they, 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 yeah. they love yeah. animals. I know that. Yes, they do. They do. Thank you. Um, so how can people support you best? I mean, you need volunteers. Can they just, is it all through your website? I know I'll, I'll put on the show notes all the different social media sites because you're on all of those. But um, as far we, as um, like your greatest needs, is it financial? Is it volunteers or both? But 
it, it, all of the above, but this year in particular, our financial mm-hmm. need is great. Is it, um, is it? After being in our last location for over seven years, we had to relocate the whole operation this year. And wow. um, it's, it's, it's been a very expensive process, both the move and then getting the building up to um, the, with all the equipment and the resources okay, that yeah. we need to be able to operate in it. So it took a lot of our reserves to get ourselves set up in the new facility and really I'm lay the foundation for yeah. the, the next eight years. So finance is huge if you're and you can go to our website and make a donation or on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And then if you're somebody who likes to give supplies and things like that, we have an Amazon on wish list and then oh, of course okay. the, often the greatest thing you can give is your time and if you're ever in middle tennessee or one of the locations that we're working um we're honored to have people give their time and and um, well, and people will come down there i mean you don't have to live there right or even have you can True, just go down people who come into town all the time so you can yeah. you join a list and be say i want to volunteer next time you have an operation call me and email then- us at- Email us at volunteer at animalrescuecorps.org. You get the autoresponder uh, with the link for the application. You just fill out your application and you're in. Oh, and and you can also go to, go to the website and click volunteer and get through that way too. Okay. Is that how you get a shirt? <laughs> you got to do the time to get the shirt. <laughs> I, I'm like, where do they so sell we these? <laughs> we don't sell these shirts, okay? No, yeah. you, have to, you have to do the time. You have to earn them. Well, run. that should be an incentive enough. People love. I know somebody. Great. Maybe, maybe we can make something happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would keep that a firm thing. You got to volunteer. I love that idea. All right, you guys. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for doing Thank this. You. I'm just. I'd love to hear the stories, and uh, hopefully, we can get some people to help you help support you in any way, a lot of ways. Hope I didn't gross Thank you, you so out. much. And sometimes, <laughs> oh, just some of the details. <laughs> you know, oh my God, no! You are actually quite reserved. If they want to be, they want the nitty gritty. They can go look at the, go watch at the, the videos. videos. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. They're not that bad. People should watch them. They're they're really helpful. All right, love you guys. Thank you so much. So they end on an up note, so that's good. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I don't know if I made it to the end of any. (laughs) I'm glad you told me that. There's a happy ending. That helps a lot. You know there is, but all right, you guys, take care. Have a great Christmas, and uh, we will follow along. All right. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye.